to survival preparedness for the beginners and today we're going to be doing a little like a little news briefing if you want to call it that bring everybody up to speed on uh, some of the stuff that is going on i'm going to try to make this quick and painless but i figured depending on where you're at in this country or in this world uh, a little sunshine and some palm trees might make some people feel happy Instead of uh, always looking at me. So the first thing we're going to cover is the coronavirus that's going on. And as of today, it has infected more than 71,000 people around the world. Mostly in uh, China, as we all know. Uh, the death toll is, as of this morning, was 1,775 people. Including five people outside mainland China. Um... And well, so we all have been seeing about those cruise ships, you know, another 99 cases have been confirmed and quarantined above, you know, the Diamond Princess cruise ship in Japan, the U.S. We have evacuated more than, uh, I believe it's around 300 Americans from the ship. Uh, Canada, Italy, and Hong Kong are also sending flights for their citizens. The one thing... I understand, you know, being that, you know, a citizen of the United States and you're stuck somewhere, you want to come home and everything else. Uh, the, the, the issue that I have with uh, uh, bringing some of these people home is uh, you're bringing the virus here. Um, I know that's a touchy situation, but in all reality, uh, if you really have to uh, think about what is going on and um, the treatment that they... Uh, are getting over there between what the treatment could be over here yes it's probably better over here um, but then again like I said we're also bringing the virus to this country you know um, just something to ponder yeah I know it's a touchy subject you know if I had loved ones you know that may be a hard call to make but you know in all reality it is what it is um, one of the biggest the factors that's going into this right now is uh, um, with all this stuff that's going on, um, we're going to start off with the, the real reason why it's, it's hitting mainstream. It's not so much of uh, the people that are dying and stuff. It's, uh, it's called money, you know. Uh, there's a decline in China's demand now, sending world uh, oil prices lower. Cutbacks by American companies may be ahead, but drivers are benefiting. Yes, for once in our life, we get to benefit from something. has to be a tragedy, but, you know, the, the good old oil companies aren't, you know, screwing us. We're, they're getting screwed at this point, is what this comes down to. Um, oil and natural gas uh, producers, you know, they've been suffering uh, the low com commodity prices for the past year and now expect a sharp drop in global prices for their own productions. Um, just to give you an example, on January uh, 6, um, price per barrel was $63.27. On February 13th, it was $51.42. Um, you know, it's like a 20%, you know, decline <clears throat> in, you know, a little over a month. And they expect for it to keep going down. Um, you know, because China buys... They buy roughly around, uh, I believe I remember reading, uh, about 200,000 barrels a day from us. And um, we usually, uh, in the United States, we produce about eight, 8.5 to 9 million barrels a day for exports. Um, the, mid, the benchmark prices are, are what's really going to, you know, down the, the, the crap shooter there. Um, You know, it, it's it's so sad how all this stuff all comes down to money and what these people are all worried about in the global economy. You know, um, there's more than 50 million people that are affected by a tra either travel lockdowns um, and like uh, the epicenter of this coronavirus, China and those areas, the center of the outbreak, the slowing gasoline consumption. And that whole region, you know, because they closed everything down. Everything was shut down. Uh, nobody was going to work, no, you know, doing anything. There's no flights. Uh, so, you know, leaving 
a glut of, you know, there's a ton of jet fuel and diesel in the global markets at a time when, you know, nobody's buying it because, you know, they don't have to fill up those huge 747s and everything else. Um, that that's that's really hitting them hard, you know, and <clears throat> the, you know the, the big question is whether you know with the Saudis if they're gonna you know if they're gonna put like their oil in storage or you know if, to ride this thing out or if you know they're gonna see less money coming in, you know, <clears throat> you know OPEC and the big guys like you know your uh, Exxon Mobil and Chevron it's not a big deal for them you know they can uh, they can handle a little bit of what's going on and the cuts and everything else it's the smaller all these small companies and oil refinery places and rigs and stuff that you know it's probably going to put them out of business unfortunately you know they're all going to probably be filing for bankrupt and then, you know, if this thing ever does pass or anything, and then everything goes, you know, picks back up, then there's going to be shortages. The prices are going to go through the roof, and we, the consumers, are going to be the ones paying the price. Like I said, this all keeps coming back to money. <clears throat> um, it's just, it, it's, it's sad to see how, you know, this could, you know, affect so many workers in just our, our country alone. You know, they're, they're talking, um, you know, in Texas, so let alone, there could be over 100,000 jobs, people laid off from all these small refineries, oil rigs. You know, there's a lot that goes into it that a lot of people just don't know. Um, but China has become, you know, a much more important engine to the world economy over the last, you know, 17 years, and medical researchers cannot be sure that the new virus will fade during the warmer weather like the flu. Um, that's, that's one of the funny marks that I kind of like about this. But while lower oil prices hurt producers, they benefit American drivers. The agile national price of regular gas has dropped 12 cents per gallon over the last month, according to AAA. And that's a break, particularly for the lower income motorists who tend to drive older vehicles that are less fuel efficient and spend higher percentages of their income on energy. Um, you know, refineries can buy and store cheaper fuels for the summer when demand will be higher. Producers are not so lucky. You know, it's, uh, you know, the one big question, I guess, is, you know, how fast can the Chinese stop this virus from spreading and start picking in? you know, up the oil demand again and, you know, get get the country moving again. It's like uh, they came into a stalemate. I saw on the news here a couple days ago where, you know, they were talking about, uh, you know, exports coming in. Um, they were going to start putting a stop to that until they can figure out, you know, what this virus is, how it's being transferred or to, you know, from people. And it could be in goods that are coming over here on containers. And, you know, that'll, that'll put it well forget Walmart they'll be out of business because everything there is China and you know it'll put a real hurting on everybody here because we don't make anything in this country anymore we you know it all comes from overseas you know there's your problem but it all came back to money everything comes back to money now we're getting to but the governments, you know, they're, uh, you know, all over the place, you know, they're declaring mass quarantines, the travel bans, and efforts to stop or at least slow the spread of the world's newest, you know, cor this coronavirus, you know, the, the main outbreak watchers, which is, you know, the president over in China and, you know, our president here, Trump, you know, they have logged, you know, they're putting all this hope in that, you know, it's going to be like the flu. And as I quote, will peter out when weather, warmer weather arrives. So we're throwing all our eggs in the basket. That, hey, when it warms up, this thing's just going to die out and everything's going to go back to hunky-dory. That's a good strategy plan. All right, so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about what can be going on with all this kind of stuff and how maybe this is not going to be... Uh, what they think it is and how this could turn out 
slowly over the next, say, 30 years could be a, uh, um, a pretty uh, nasty little thing that's going around. As the human population continues to climb, you know, uh, will there come a time when the world runs out of few food, food, you know? The United Nations and, you know, all these agricultural organizations have been asking this question for some time. You know, everybody asks questions, but people aren't having any uh, true answers. And if they do have answers, governments don't want to follow along with them because it costs money. The United Nations Food Organization estimates that the world population will surpass 94 billion people by 2050, at which point the agricultural system in this world will not be able to supply enough food to feed everyone. So, with that said, the report... um, it continues to release that when they released this thing in Geneva, um, uh, I believe it was last week, uh, found that the window to address the threat is closing rapidly. A half a billion people are already living in places turning into deserts. The soil is being lost between 10 and 100 times faster than it's forming, according to the report. Climate change will will make those threats even worse, you know, because you got to figure you're going to have more floods and more droughts. Storms and other types of extreme weather threaten to disturb and over time shrink the global food supply. Already more than 10% of the world's population remains undernourished. And some authors also report warned in interviews that food shortages could lead to an increase in cross-border migration. You know, you want to know why people want to leave all their third world countries and they try to come here and get in here. And... You know, why we have to protect our borders and everything else and what's going on in this country. And, you know, because they see us as a a safe haven, if you want to put it that way. But then again, if we start letting everybody just come in freely, we're going to have problems because then we're not going to be able to feed everybody that's here. And it's a two-edged sword. But it all comes back to money again. Now let's talk about the countries that are doing the most to to protect the environment. And this is pretty sad. As an American, I say this is pretty sad. Alright? Number one, Denmark. Number two, Finland. Number three, Norway. Number four, New Zealand. Number five, Australia. Number six, Canada. Number seven, United States. And number eight, Bulgaria. That's just the top eight. Why are we number seven? Why are we not up there by number one or number one? Can anybody out there answer that question? Put your comments in below. Just put your comments down there and let's see if you come out with the right answer. But we've already been talking about it. Here's another great piece of news that just came out. few days ago, Antarctica just saw its all-time hottest day ever. Temperature in Antarctica reached 69 degrees last week, just a few days after setting another record high of 64. Unbelievable. It's the first time the temperature on the continent has exceeded 20 degrees Celsius, which is 68 degrees. Researchers told... But it was not the first time the continent has seen new record-breaking highs for this month. On February 6th, a researcher station in Antarctica Peninsula in the northwestern tip close to South America reported a high of 64, surpassing the previous record of 63 set in March of 2015. You know, everything's just getting, you know, it's... These glaciers, you know, I mean, uh, one of the uh, Antarctica's fastest shrinking glaciers just lost an iceberg twice the size of Washington, D.C. You see this stuff in the news anywhere? No, they don't want to tell us about that. They don't want to scare people. They wanted to buy those multi million dollar homes right on the beach, you know, where in another 10 years they're all going to be underwater. 
It's going to be like the new Venice. All right, for, for those of you people, you know, what is an ice age? An ice age is a time where a significant amount of the Earth's water is locked up on land in a continental glacier. All right, the last, last ice age was about 12,000 years ago. At that time, the sea level was 120 meters lower than today. And let me break that down for you. That's 393 feet. The onslaught of an ice age is related to the changes in the Earth's tilt and orbit. The Earth is due for another ice age now, but climate change makes it very unlikely. It's just some of this stuff you just don't know what to say. You know, I worry about my kids, my grandkids, and everything else. You know, maybe as a human being, uh, it doesn't matter if you live in the United States, wherever you live in this world, you're going to be affected by all this kind of stuff. You know, this climate change. Uh, there's no choice. There's no chance of us going into an ice age now because the greenhouse gases we put into the atmosphere during the industrial era, basically over the last 200 years, has warmed the earth. Uh, you know, in the very beginning, you know, they, they weren't really aware of and didn't know anything about climate change and what they were doing, so they were burning coal and, you know, all these, you know, fuels and whatever they could get their hands on to get us to where we are now, and now we have to try to reverse that and go backwards. You know, I live in a state, I live in Florida, you know, um, you would think down here, they would have a, a, some type of a, uh, um, the government here would have, you know, want everybody to have solar on every freaking house that's around here, you know, uh, just for the fact is, it's always sunny, you're seeing what I see, blue skies, sunshine, palm trees, um, why wouldn't you have it? You know, back in the last ice age, you know, humans could just walk from New Guinea to the Australian mainland. Think about that. Just take a little road trip. Just drive right across. Personally, I don't think I'd walk. I'd try to find me a horse. Uh, during the last ice age, um, which ran from about 110,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago, the lower sea levels allowed humans to move across, out across the entire world. You didn't even have to worry about having boats or anything. You could just walk wherever you wanted to go. You could walk all the way around the planet if you wanted to. Um, some of the challenges that we're going to be facing, you know, between now and uh, 2050, you know, it's going to be overpopulation. You know, we're talking close to 9.4 billion people by 2050. Resource de depletion, you know, fueled by overpopulation and toxin pollution and escalating global warming, you know, but um, as it stands right now, uh, our government doesn't seem to believe in that, uh, thinks it's a hoax. I'm not trying to get political here, so keep your comments to yourself. Um, I'm just stating the facts. Uh, global economic instability, um, you know, I mean, you're going to have all these poverty countries and everything else. It's it's just going to get ugly, and everybody's going to want to come to the big countries, United States, China, Russia, maybe England. Uh, political instability, you know, um, it's going to come to where if some of these countries all break down and everything else, you know, there's going to have to be some... Um, somebody to, you know, take over and keep this all under check, you know, you know, failure to involved into a single government or something with, you know, some type of a legislature or ju judicial or enforceable executive powers to, you know, keep people in check, keep them fed, uh, clothed, whatever they're going to have to do, you know, because this, this could get ugly, you know, you're going to have your global pandemics. Um, we're getting almost to the end here, people. Just bear with me. The effect of the global warming on infections and diseases. This is one thing I wanted to get to, you know, especially with this coronavirus that's going on. Because you, you, everybody should know it. I mean, unless you just, just don't have any common sense and you're just dumb as a box of rocks, this is just going to keep happening 
year after year, there's going to be something that's going to come out and it's going to kill thousands of people and, you know, it's going to cause, you know, the, the global economy to, you know, either go down, tank, it's going to affect everything, you know. Um, it has been assumed that the global warming has profound effects on infectious diseases. Uh, effect of global warming on infectious diseases is in, indirect, although the effects have been detected worldwide. The degree and types of the effect are different depending on the location in respective countries and situations. Among infection diseases, water and foodborne infection diseases and vector-borne infection diseases are two main categories that are focused to be most infected. Let me break that down for you real quick here. We start with climate change, all right? That's a gradual, a gradual change, global warming, changes in rainfall, extreme events, storms and floods. The affected factor is it contaminates water and food by bacteria, increases the number of activity of vectors, and expansion of infested areas. The infested area right now is over in China. That's where the most of all this is. You know, what I say, 71,000 people, you know, almost 1,800 people dead. That's the infested area. Um, we start moving all these people around and start moving them from one continent to another continent. And the next thing you know, you've got a global disaster. The projected effects, increased in water and foodborne diseases, increased in expansion of mosquito-borne infectious diseases. So all those <clears throat> tires that you got sitting around your house and old buckets and everything that are full of water and stuff, make sure you just dump those things out. You know, just help yourself out because those mosquitoes, you know, they've already been spraying around here. I've lived in this house for almost six years now, five years. And, um, you know, I've never seen them spraying in January and February. And they've been going by here constantly spraying. You know, it's like they want to get on top of this for one reason. It hasn't cooled off like it normally does. Well, we've had a couple of cool days, but most of the time we're in the 80s and pushing almost 90 again. And it's not even summertime. You know, <clears throat> you know, there's going to be a direct effect of global warming on the human health other than infection diseases. Um, they have reported that the global warming has, you know, direct effects on viruses aspects of the human health, including infectious diseases. They include also, you know, heat related diseases caused by heat waves, injuries and deaths caused by extremely global and geological events. Um, you know, I mean, it, it all comes down to there's just too much stuff going on and sometimes it gets just a little bit scary and everything else. Um, there's no evidence that climate change triggered this particular virus to jump from animals to humans, right? I mean, they haven't proved anything yet. And at this time, at least, uh, the warmer planet has helped it spread... That said, it's pretty clear that, broadly speaking, climate change is likely to lead to more than likely an uptick in future epidemics caused by viruses and other pathogens. Scientists, you know, they've understood this for decades, that climate change would change the way diseases spread, but the planet warms. Those hypotheses are being tested, and scientists are learning in real time. Um... Not a good thing to be really learning really in real time, but I guess, you know, we're in uncharted territory, if you want to put it that way. There are many links between, you know, climate change and infectious diseases. Um, that said, it's pretty clear that, you know, broadly speaking, climate change is likely to lead to uptick in future epidemics caused by viruses and, you know, pathogens. Scientists have understood for decades that climate change would change the way diseases spread, but as the planet warms, those hypotheses are being tested and scientists are learning in real time. Um, I just wanted to repeat that for you, you know, the real time thing. You know, it's, um, that's the scary part. There, you know, there's many links between climate change and infectious diseases. But on a going to focus on one particular uh, virus area of knowledge, how raising temperatures are making a natural humane system less effective. Um, you know, at, at that point, you know, it, 
it all comes down to money and you know how do they can control this and try to get one step ahead of it unfortunately you know nobody plans for these things um, but when it starts to hit the world markets and uh, you know all the big weeks out there start losing money and their corporations are going down the tubes and stuff that's when you're really gonna see something done they don't really care about us little people you know um, they like to keep us dumb and stupid um, you know, they only want to tell us what they think we need to know. Um, you really have to dig around on the internet and you can find out some information. Uh, feel free to, to do so yourself. You know, it's out there. You just have to dig for it because they try to keep it buried in some of these small time, you know, little articles and stuff that are out there. Uh, unfortunately, I have had the time to sit there and do that. Um, you know, the scary part of, of it is, is, you know, I'm not trying to put this any information out here to scare anybody or to make this a doomsday type scenario thing or anything else. I'm trying to bring you some of the news that's coming out there that, uh, you know, a lot of people just don't see because they just choose not to put that on the air. Um, you know, it's just part of the way that the, the government and the news media, you know, in my opinion, all run hand in hand. You know, they both say they don't. But in the long run, you know, think about it, they do. You know, if that wasn't the case, and you know, a lot of this stuff would all be on, you know, your nightly news, you know, instead of, you know, whatever else is on there. But I just wanted to have do a quick video and uh, just bring some of this stuff to people's attention. I told everybody I'd try to keep everybody posted on what I saw was coming out and going on. And uh, once again, you know, this is... This isn't to scare you or anything else. This is just to give you an eye opener. And um, like I said, if you want to do your own research, just get on the internet and just start digging. You'll find it. Trust me, it really ain't that hard. And uh, you know, some of the, you know, you find articles from, you know, some of the big places too, but they're buried in, you know, the back of their papers or whatever. New York Times, Washington Post, um, you know, go on. I can list off a ton Fox News CNN ABC News you know but it's just not a headline so with that said my name is Charles this is a survival preparedness for beginners and I just wanted to bring you a little video just to give you an idea and an update of what is going on in this lovely world that we live in and from my aspect of what I see and what you're looking at it's a beautiful world and I don't want anything to happen to it so, till next time, I'll catch you on the flip side.